We do welcome you here to Brushy Creek and online to Brushy Creek. Happy Father's Day to all of you uh, fathers out there. I had a, had a wonderful father. His life was cut short and my time with him was cut short. Um, but I also have a heavenly father that over the years has, has continued to heal me from that. Thank you for all the dads out there. Sir. Good morning, everybody. Oh, how are you all doing? We've got a, a pretty good crowd here this morning. It's good to see you. Happy Father's Day. You know, I was thinking about, thank you, um, I was thinking about Father's Day and those of us that still have our fathers and those who do not. My, my mom and dad both passed away within a year of each other back in the 1990s. In fact, because my mom and dad were in their 40s when I was born, um, most of my family, my aunts and uncles and um, mom and dad, sister, everybody has gone to be with the Lord. Uh, coming along a little bit later in life like that can, can have that effect. So my family at home uh, is my family and my extended family because uh, I don't have a whole lot left over from when I was growing up. But you know, I've learned since 1996, when my dad passed away, that God is a father to the fatherless. His grace, his love for us is poured out in exactly the places where it's needed the most. And sometimes we forget that. We, th- we kind of think of God as, as a d- generic sometimes. Um, yes, he cares about us. But when he cares, the, when the Bible says, God cares about us. He cares about you. You need to individualize that and understand that because he knows you, he created you, he knows your needs. And if there's pain that you're feeling today because you miss your dad, God's grace can encourage you. And one of the best things he can do is give you wonderful memories of the loved one that you lost. And sometimes those can be very comforting. I was going through some old pictures the other day. It was my dad and my grandfather uh, back, you know, they were standing next to a Model A. I mean, just great pictures that'll, that are kind of take you back to the past, but also encourage you and remind you that they came along in your life somewhere. God had them in your life for a specific time. And that can be very encouraging. All right, let's take God's word and turn to Psalm 78, if you'd turn there with me. Next week, we begin a series called Faith Works. That's just the name, Faith Works. It's from the book of James. And you can imagine some of what will come out of that by the title of the series. But there's so much in James um, as we dig in. I'm really excited about getting started going through that book together. Let's stand as we read God's word. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell them to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare his heart, its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Thank you. You can be seated. Charles Plum was a U.S. Naval Academy graduate. He was a jet pilot in Vietnam. He was an ace. He flew 25 missions during the Vietnam War, but he was shot down in his saber jet during the war, and he spent six years after parachuting into the enemy's hands, he spent six years in a communist prison camp. After he got out, after the war was over and he was released, He travels around the country lecturing and giving talks about his experiences to encourage other people to be able to endure hardship. 
And after, at one of these places where he had just given a talk, he, he and his family were sitting in a restaurant that evening, and a man came up to him and he said, you're Charles Plum. You flew missions off the USS Kitty Hawk. You were shot down. And Charles Plum looked at him and he said, I, how in the world would you know that? He said, I was on that ship. I packed your parachute. And he grabbed his hand and started shaking his hand. And Charles Plum said, man, I can't believe that I'm meeting the person responsible for me being here. And the guy looked at him and said, well, I guess it worked. <laughs> and Plum said, well, yeah, I'm here today because you did a, a good job in what you were supposed to do. Later that night, as he was thinking about it, he had a little bit of trouble going to sleep because he was thinking about this guy down in the bowels of the ship, big long table, and what he did most of his time was pack parachutes meticulously, just making it so that he, it would be sure to open. Now, I think I told you my sister was a skydiver, sport parachutist, and when I was 12 years old, she taught me to pack her chute. Now, think about that. But I would pack them and toss them to her while she was doing competition skydiving. And so she lived a nice long life. She didn't have any problems with her chute opening. Actually, if you just get that pilot chute in the right place, um, the rest of it pretty much takes care of itself. But it does need to be done well. You know, here's my question. This is my thought that I want you to get from that story, how we apply it. Where today in our culture, or I should say who, is packing the parachute of fathers. And what I mean by that is our culture has pushed fathers out. In fact, our culture is doing a pretty good job of nullifying the effect of the traditional family. Mom, dad, home, kids working to raise the next generation. So what, what can we do about that? And, and the first thing we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, is it really that bad? I mean, what is the effect? Is it, is it just part of life that a lot of times fathers are not in the home or that mothers and fathers are not raising their kids together? Does that really matter all that much? Well, let's think about some of the numbers. I was shocked when I looked this up. Out of wedlock birth rate. It's 77% in the African-American community, 49% in the Hispanic community, and 33% for whites. Now, think about that. That's a lot of children being born without the benefit of a stable home. That has to have a tremendous effect. And children need both a mom and a dad in order for their life set to be put in motion in a way that's going to be beneficial for them, for them to be successful. And yet, they're starting out in life without that. The divorce rate is 50%. Children living in single-parent homes, that's, and the vast majority of those that live in single-parent homes are living with their mothers, and there's not a father in the picture. So what has that done? Or, or, or can, can we look at things and say, well, there, there's, there, there's an effect of that. The teenage suicide rate, for example. Right now, the teenage suicide, teenage suicide is the second leading cause of death among teenagers. In 2019, 6,700 teenagers took their own life. A lot of this is connected to the lack of influence in the home, the stability that's necessary in order for kids to be able to find their way, to grow up, to mature, and to determine who they are. So the family as a unit is in trouble. Recently, there was a, a prominent feminist leader that wrote this, dads, try not to be offended. More, but, but she wrote, she said, fathers are a biological necessity, but a psychological absurdity. Thanks a lot. But you know, that kind of mindset is being pushed back on from the data that we're getting. In fact, there was an article in U.S. News and World Report that said this, more than virtually any other factor, a biological father's presence in the family 
will determine a child's success and happiness. Wow. More than any other factor. Think about that. You look at all the things, poverty, the lack of poverty, wealth, poverty, single parent, uh, what, whatever you want to look at within the home, the, the father's present. If there's a father who is committed and present and having an influence over his family and helping to pass on values, that is the single most telling factor as to whether or not the children are going to be successful. That's an incredible statistic to me. The sociology department at the University of Texas made this statement, the plague of fatherlessness is a painful inheritance of poverty and illness that is passed down from one generation to the next. So if that's true, if dads are important, how can we stop the free fall? What is it that we need to, as a culture, look to to help support dads in the home? And what do we need to do, dads, if we're in that stage of life, and I'm still in that stage of life. i got three grown children, but i got to tell you, I have as much contact with them now as just about as I did when they were living under my own roof. Because they come home, they, they want to know, they, they're trying to live life, and particularly as they start having children. You know, my kids, for a while, there's a time gap in there where kids think their parents don't know anything. And then life begins to happen to them. And they start to, they go to work, and they start to have children of their own. And all of a sudden, <laughs> my intelligence quotient just got real high. And it's got, it's, it's got nothing to do except with this, that we understand that experience means things. And it's good to have somebody there who can say, yes, I've walked that path. Let me, if you'll listen, let me tell you at least from my experience. You know, I, there, there's a transition that takes place that's healthy where I don't tell my kids what to do anymore. I tell them what I did or what I think God's Word says and I let it sit with them, and then I sit back and watch them make their decisions. And that's, that's an important part. We need to stay connected even after our kids are gone. But the first thing that I want to talk about is the parachute of praise. Look at verse 4. We will not conceal them from our children, from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord. Now, now listen to these statistics, and I know statistics, statistics can get boring, but these just fascinated me when I looked all this stuff up. If both of your parents worshipped regularly while you were growing up, do you know what the chance is that you will go to church and worship regularly? 80%. What? You know, that 80%. If an example is present, now I'm not talking about I took my kids to church. I'm talking about we all went to church as a family. If that's the experience, 80% of those that come from that environment are going to likely leave that as an important part of their life, coming to worship. If your father worshiped with you, there's a 70% chance. Let's say that, and this happened in my household, and it's a long story, but my mom got very disillusioned and cynical about church um, and, as, after I had come along. So it was my dad that took me to church. I went to church with him. In fact, he and I were baptized together. And, and it's, there's something about dads. 70% of those who worshipped with their dad, if their dad was the one that was driving the ship, if their dad was the one that was saying it's important to praise the Lord, then 70% of the next generation followed that example and went to church and praised the Lord and were actively engaged in ministry. So the spiritual leadership of the father is critical to the spiritual development of the children. You know, the Bible tells us in Psalm 35, 18, I will give thanks to you in the great congregation. I will praise you among a mighty throng. Listen to Psalm 111, 1. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Can I translate that for you? I will praise you in church. 
In other words, it matters. Yes, you can praise God. And I have people tell me this all the time, and you know the old story. Preacher, I can praise God out on the lake. Yes, you can, and yes, you should. But there's only one place that you can praise God in the assembly, and that's when we're assembled. And the Bible says that that's important. It's important for the next generation. You know, I I have to ask myself, and, and, and I used to be kind of quiet when I would go to church. I mean, I confess, you know, I, I was, my, my grandmother was a foot washing Baptist. Remember I told you that last, last week? And when I would go to church with her, she was primitive. It's called primitive Baptist. And when I'd go to church with her, man, it didn't matter what the preacher was preaching because I couldn't hear him. I mean, he was up there, and, and by the way, the primitive Baptist preachers, they kind of have this method. It's kind of a sing-song type they get into a rhythm and there's a lot of syllables thrown in that really don't have a lot of meaning I can't I can't even do it I, I can't it was, it was an amazing thing to watch but you know I, and and being in that environment it kind of caused me to think you know I think I would like for it to be a little quieter but then I go to a football game and sometimes, I mean, I had to remind myself, when I would go watch the Gamecocks play on Saturday, I had to remind myself, have to, because I see so much orange, that when I say that, I just know people are going, mm, mm, mm. But when I'd go to watch the Gamecocks play on Saturday, I had to, I had to think to myself, I mean, you know, with, with Clemson, you, they run down the hill, they rub the rock, you know, that... In Columbia, it's cocky comes out and there's the curtains around him and they're playing 2001 and they drop the curtain and the smoke goes up and the players run out and the place is packed. And I mean, I have to consciously tell myself, don't ruin your voice. Because I've done that before. I've got, man, I was in, in Columbia one year when we beat Georgia and I was just, but when I got home, I couldn't speak and I'm thinking I don't know that the church is going to understand tomorrow when I get up in the pulpit and I I talk like this because I yell my head off at a Gamecock game but here's the thing if the things listen the things that excite us the things that raise us to a level where we get to that point of excitement and high-fiving and yelling those are the things that get communicated to a generation that that's what's important because what we pour that much energy into is going to send a symbol of a, a, a sign of what's important and I'm just saying there's nothing wrong listen man if, if I ever get to go to a Cowboys game you better know I'll be yelling I just want to be sure that when I come into the presence of the king of the universe that I'm not afraid or ashamed or reserved in my expression of praise because I believe that that sends a message. I think it tells the next generation what we think is most important. Second thing, the parachute of parameters. Look at verse 5. It says, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. Fathers are called to teach God's word to our children we shouldn't let that just happen in Sunday school it doesn't need to happen just in church it doesn't need to happen in Christian school private school homeschool dads we need to be the ones that are taking God's word and giving it to the next generation it matters I you know what I don't even know why it matters if you were to ask me preacher what what does it make such a big difference that a dad communicates God's word as opposed to a mom I don't know I just know when you look at the statistics, my my answer would be, well, God kind of set it up that way. We're the spiritual leaders in the home. And so the law, the ordinances, the, the, the boundaries, kids, children, young people want boundaries. We think they don't. In fact, the culture tells us that if we're good parents, what we're really doing is interfering in the lives of our children they try to tell us that oh no 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 parents hands off your children they get to make their own decisions we're even being told today that children as young as four or five years old need to be able to determine which gender that they're going to be and we don't need to have any influence over that and if we do try to have influence it's because we're bigoted or we've got some kind of bad attitude listen we have to stand against a trend 
in the culture that says that parental instruction and leadership is a bad thing. It's the best of things. It's the thing that makes the greatest difference in the life of the next generation. Major University did a study on the effects of boundaries on the play habits of children. And in the first part of the study, they put kids out in an open area with no fencing, no adults nearby, no supervision, no suggestions, and they just let them go. And they kind of wandered around aimlessly. In the second part of the test, they put the kids in a closed environment where there was a fence that went around that showed definite boundaries and there were adults nearby to offer some suggestions and some direction. And those kids were much more creative and much more comfortable in the way that they behaved with each other and much more well behaved than those that were just left with nothing. Boundaries work. And they work because it's God's formula for passing on to the next generation. Our children need to know the difference between right and wrong. We need to have the courage to teach it and to speak it and not be afraid, but to teach that generation what's right according to God's word, even if the world says that it's wrong. Because this is where we lose the battle. We lose the battle. We as Christians, we know or should know what God teaches about life, about truth, about relationships, about sexuality, about race, about everything. It's all in here. God didn't leave anything out. And if we absorb that and pass it on, then our world gets to be a lot better place. But when we neglect to do that, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. Third thing is the parachute of participation. Verse 6, take a look at it. That the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. Arise and tell them. You know, if we're going to arise and tell our children something, we have to be there to do it. And a lot of times it's easy. I mean, I listen, I go back and I think about my kids and I think about the times when maybe I put doing something else as a priority over taking care or spending time with my kids. You know, we used to go on, when we'd go on vacation to the beach, I'm a, I'm a big beach bum. And, and when my kids were young, you know, they wanted to play in the sand and dig. I mean, all they wanted, what is it, kids? They just, they just dig holes. And, and they want me to lay in them and then bury me in the sand. And, all, and I look, I just took my chair out there, I took my book, I, I was a beach reader, that's what I wanted. I wanted to sit on the beach and read. And so, Denise, pretty much the same way. So we had our matching chairs, we were very stylish, and we'd go out to the beach and we'd open up the chairs and we'd lay back and we'd be reading our books. And we were doing this one time, and I'll never forget this, Amber came up and she was standing there looking at us and we weren't paying any attention, you know, was, go, go play on the beach, play on the beach. And Amber said, do you have a book that I can read? <clears throat> I put the book down, and I went and let her bury me in the sand. Now, you, I, that may sound like a stupid illustration, but I'm telling you, it matters. We can't just, dads, moms too, but dads particular, because this is, the, the, the scripture points to this, the statistics point to this. We can't just be there and think that our presence is enough to mold and to form. We have to participate. We've got to be not only present, but actually participating in, spending time with, intentionally teaching, and teaching as we go. You know, I remember when Allison, I made a fool out of myself when Allison was running track, my youngest daughter because she got to be pretty good. And in fact, she still has the record, I think, at Greer High School for the 800-meter run. And the 800-meter run is pretty, it, if you've never seen one, it's pretty exciting because it's four laps around the track. Now, two laps around the track. So the first time, you know, Allison had a strategy. And the first time around the track, she would move up into the middle of the pack. And then she'd come around, they'd come, and then the second time around the track, she'd, be, she'd begin about the first turn to move up into the top three. On the back stretch, she'd move into second. 
in the last turn or the the far turn the quarter turn she would move and get close and then as they turned and came down the stretch her strategy was to turn on what she had left and to pass the person that was first before they got to the finish line down the back stretch and she ran every race just like that always her strategy perfect can you imagine what that does to a dad I mean I remember one time at she, was, she came around that back stretch, and the girl she was running against was the district champion. And Allison, this was, the, this was the district finals, and Allison was trying to beat her. And they were coming down that back stretch, and Allison was closing. And, I, and, and it looked like it was really going to be close as to whether she could pass her before they got to the finish line. So I did the only thing that I could do. I jumped out of the stands and ran down the fence yelling, Go, baby, go! I mean, I thought they were going to come and put me in the cuffs. I really did. Because, I mean, I was, I'm running down, and, and there were people laughing, and I didn't care. She passed her and won the race. Now, I wish I could tell you that I did that every time, but I missed too many races. I missed too many opportunities. We've got, dads, we've got to be there, not just, just, just participate in a tangential way but to participate in a way that allows us to pass on the teaching of God intentionally as we sit and share God's word and go to church with them but also in life as we have opportunities in life to share God's word as we live it out together let me give you an example of this one of the most powerful stories and the history of the Olympic Games involved a canoeing specialist named Bill Havens. He was a shoe-in to win the, cano- the gold medal in canoeing in 1924 in the Olympics. But he found out that his wife was going to give birth about the time that he would have to leave to go to the Olympics. And so he made the decision to stay home. And a lot of people thought, his wife told him, I'll be fine, you don't have to be here. He said, no, I have to be here for my son. I want my son to know that I was there when he was born. So he skipped the Olympics. Well, he never went back and tried again. There was not another opportunity for him. But he poured his life into this little boy. And so 25 years later, his little boy, Frank Havens, qualifies for the Olympics. And he came home with a gold medal that he and his dad shared And he said to his dad, he said, Dad, thanks for being there for me. And thanks for pouring into my life. This medal should have been yours. Now I'm giving it to you. It's a true story from the Olympics. It's an example of what can happen when participation, a dad makes the decision, these are my priorities, the home, the family, and my my next generation, my children, I'm going to pour everything into them. When, when that decision gets made, it's amazing the things that can come out of it culturally. In his book, Seven Secrets of Effective Fathers, Ken, Ken Hatfield lists these things. Being committed to their children, that's number one, the secret of being a good father. Make sure that you're committed. What does that mean? Well, it means that your children are priority. They're not just somebody that lives in the house that take up space, that cost money, that have to have their teeth fixed. They're, they're, they're a priority. They're, you're committed to the fact that they're important. Number two, knowing your children. Know what drives them. I knew from the time my son was in the sixth grade that he was going to be a reporter because that's what drove him. I mean, he was on the school newspaper when he was a freshman in high school. First thing he did when he went to the University of South Carolina was go sign up to be to a, a writer for the Gamecock newspaper. And by the time he was a junior, he was the editor of the Gamecock. And then he became the editor of another magazine. I mean, it, that, it was just in him. And I did everything I could. I let him be a stringer uh, for the Greenville News to cover high school football. I gave him the car. I bought his gas. I, I, I mean... I did whatever I could because as I got to know him, I, I, I realized this was his gift and he needed somebody to, to be there to just give a gentle push. 
That's what, that's what he's talking, that's what I said Hatfield is Canfield. That's what Ken Canfield is talking about when he says, know your children, know their strengths, and be there to push. Be consistent in your attitude and behavior. Protect and provide for their children. And this one may be the most important. Love your children's mother. Make sure that your children grow up in an environment where they see fathers that you respect, honor, and love their mother. That's an important example. And it, it, it really makes a difference in family relationships of your children as they grow up and start their own families. Number six and seven, being active listeners and spiritually equipping. We've been talking about the importance of spiritual equipping. But actively listening, listening not just letting them stand there. How many times have you been doing something and, a, and one, of your, one of your kids comes up and starts to talk to you and you're not really, you're hearing them, but you're still trying to focus on what's in front of you. When that happens, when they come, stop what you're doing, even if it's for just for a minute. Stop what you're doing and focus. Now, if you've got to get back to the thing that's in front of you, Focus long enough to redirect their energy, but hear what they're saying and always, always demonstrate your willingness to be attentive because listening is one of the most important things that we do. All right, number four, the parachute of a prepared heart. Verse seven and eight. Notice it says that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious, uh, rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart. What is a prepared heart? Well, to find that out, we have to go back in Matthew to the parable of the seed and the sower in Matthew 13. You know, really, that, that parable is not just about the seed. The seed really doesn't change in the parable, the nature of the seed. It's not the nature of the seed that determines whether it's received. It's the nature of the soil. And the first example is the hard ground where the seed lands on top. It never penetrates. The birds come and eat it up before it can have any kind of effect. The second ground is rocky ground. In other words, it's shallow dirt. And so the, the seed goes in and immediately it starts to grow up, but it can't grow down. And because it can't get depth of root, it withers and dies. And then the next piece of ground is not cleared it's 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 broken up but it's full of weeds and so when the seed gets down and it begins to grow the weeds choke it out and then the last example Jesus says there's the broken fallow ground the seed goes in the roots go down the fruit comes up and it produces 70 80 90 fold see this is fathers we need a prepared heart before God, a heart that's broken, a heart that's open, a heart that's humble, a heart that says, God, here I am, pour into me, let the harvest begin in me, let, let the fruit be planted, the seed be planted, and the fruit be evident for me and for my children, for my family, and for the next generation. Dr. James Dobson tells the story of a family from the Midwest that lived on a farm for a hundred years, five generations. And the children always were anxious to go to the field because that's what the adults did. I mean, the adults went out during the, in the morning and they went out to the field and the children were left at the house. And when the children would get to be a certain age, they begged to go to the field. They just didn't want to hang around the house anymore. And so one day the father said, okay, I'm going to let the kids go to the field. The grandfather came to him and said, make me a promise. Promise me that if you're going to let these kids go out in the field, that they stay all day, no matter what. And so the father made the promise. So the kids were excited. They go out in the field. First part of the, part of the morning is exciting. It's kind of cool, and the work's not too hard, and the dust hasn't started to rise but by lunchtime, the sun's beating down on them. It's nasty, it's dirty, it's dusty, the work is hard, and the children start to whine and say, we want to go to the house. And the father said, no, when you come into the field, you stay all day. You stay until the work is done. 
And so at the end of the day, they all ended up back at the house. And the grandfather came to the father. He said, I want to thank you for honoring my request. You need to understand something. This farm has survived five generations and has always produced a harvest because we've always stayed in the field. And when I think about that, the harvest for us in our day, the harvest is the next generation. The harvest is our children. The harvest is those that we pour into. We want them to have a better life than we do. We want them to be smarter than we were. We want them to create an environment and a culture that's better than the one that we were given by our parents. Our parents. How do we do that? We stay faithful. We stay in the field. We participate. We focus. We teach. And we pass on the truth to the next generation. And then there can be a harvest. There'll always be a harvest. There'll always be a remnant. There'll always be those who are willing to take a stand in the culture as long as we're preparing them and preparing their hearts because our hearts have been broken and we've got something to hand off to them. Let's stand together for our invitation. Father, I thank you for the power that is in your word. I thank you, God, that as a dad, that you've given me the opportunity to pour into my children. And Lord, for dads that are here today, I pray that the understanding of the responsibility, just looking at the numbers, we see the importance of our role. The culture may not recognize it, they may not honor it, but God, it's, it's something you've called us to, and it's ultimately important that we prepare the heart of the next generation. Help us to do that.